All right, guys, so our uh, next speaker is going to be Paul Carlson. She's the director of husbandry at the Dallas World Aquarium. And today her talk is Turning a Ripple into a Wave, the Importance of Public Aquariums in Aquatic Science, Education, and Conservation. Let's welcome Paula. Well, uh, thank you guys very much for not being at Richard Ross's talk. Um, I will just let you know right up front that you will all leave with sawfish swag uh, today. So I am giving away gifts uh, for your early morning Saturday attendance. But in all sincerity, I am completely honored uh, to be standing in front of you today and speaking about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is the great work that's being done by the professionals uh, that I work alongside in the public aquarium industry. So I've got a lot to share with you and what seems like a long time is a very short amount of time for me because I can talk forever. So I want to quickly get to it and let you guys um, see uh, and let me brag a little bit about the industry that I've worked in now for 32 years. Um, one of the definitions of a ripple is, is a so slow progressing movement uh, that ultimately results in a wave. And in our business, as we well know, lots of things are changing, not only in our ocean environment, but in our own industries. And so I feel like we're in a great opportunity between what we do in public aquariums and what you all are doing in the hobby and some of the other folks that are out there and vendors in order to make some pretty significant changes for our ocean environment. So I'm going to share with you uh, some of these incredible uh, things that are going on. Now, how I got here today is a very interesting story. I'm a marine biologist who studied at Texas A&M University. I also have a whoop. I saw the Aggie in the back of the room there. Go uh, gig of mags, right? Uh, I also have a master's degree in zoo and aquarium administration uh, through George Mason University. And uh, I have had the great privilege of working with folks through the Association of Zoos and Aquariums in many programs, including mentoring our species survival plans, um, acting as an AZA inspector for more than 10 years, inspecting folks for their AZA accreditations, and I'm the vice chair of the Marine Fishes Tag that oversees all of our species survival plans uh, in the marine fish world. I'm also a member of the IUCN Shark Specialist Group and the IUCN uh, Seahorse, Pipefish, and Stickleback Specialist Group. Say that three times fast. And uh, my role in that is to link the world of public aquariums with other colleagues in other industries like research and conservation. And so over the past several years, I've had the opportunity to travel all over the world talking about important programs with sharks and seahorses. And Kevin actually asked me if I would broaden that subject to the great work that public aquariums are doing in general in some of these arenas. So that's what I'm doing here today, and I'm very humbled by the response of my colleagues who have shared some tremendous information with me. If you're not familiar with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, it's an accreditation body and the members have to go through a rigorous accreditation every five years. Every year we report to our organization the work that we're doing and they put it together in numbers that we can all understand. And uh, when those numbers are collectively displayed, they're pretty impressive. In 2017, the collective body of the accredited institutions of the AZA contributed more than 220 million US dollars in support of conservation. AZA, just the AZA aquariums alone, uh, which have an attendance of 51 million people a year um, that are at standalone aquariums and zoo and aquarium you know, combo facilities, um, saw 51 million people. There's about 39 and a half million people that attend um, just standalone aquariums. And so you can see those numbers, they're pretty impressive. Um, in 2016, they've not, they hadn't completed the numbers for 2017 when I spoke with the AZA. In 2016, just those that reported as aquariums or aquarium zoo combos spent more than $44 million on conservation. That's pretty impressive. And I wonder how many of you, when you walk into your local zoo or aquarium, beyond the rehab and the work that you see with sea turtles and seabirds and marine mammals, how many of you know 
what's going on behind the walls of those facilities. So I'm gonna share with you some stories about the incredible things that I know and that I've learned just in the process of this, which has uh, really blown me away. And, and again, I reached out to over 100 of the colleagues and there's not enough time in, in this entire week to share with you what I've learned this, this past few months. Um, there was a study that was started in 2001 uh, where uh, quantitatively folks went out and measured the public's impression of zoos and aquariums. And all of that is published in a great study called Why Zoos and Aquariums Matter. That study is actually sort of being revised right now. So uh, you may find yourself in, you know, being asked at the next time you visit your local zoo or aquarium how you feel about particular things. But it was a really broad sweeping study that I won't get into the details here. But overall, the public sees our facilities as a place to go, not only to enjoy uh, themselves and bond with their families, but a place to learn. In fact, they see us as a place to learn and they're looking for us as a place to learn. And you're gonna see as I go through these slides and, and I'll wrap it up in the end that we are doing a good job at that, but there's more that we can do and our public is gonna demand that of us. And I think we all, we all know what I'm talking about. Um, many of us in the public aquarium world already participate in some great collaborative programs that you guys are very familiar with, including programs like Rising Tide. A lot of these people are out displaying so, I'm gonna encourage you and always point you in the direction to go out there and learn more. Um, we are very fortunate at the Dallas World Aquarium to have just hired some folks who've been working with Rising Tide uh, for a number of years and developing uh, strategies for raising larval fishes, especially those that are important to the aquarium world. But I will say this, that we actually did send one of our blue tanks to the Tropical Aquaculture Lab from the Dallas World Aquarium that I hope was one of the parents of, of the success in the blue tank. So I'm gonna put a plug in for them. Uh, we also work closely, and I did not have a good uh, slide to represent that, but uh, many public aquariums work with the Coral Restoration Foundation, who is also uh, uh, out there on the vendor floor. In fact, in 2012, uh, with the help of Drew Richardson over there in the middle of the room, the Dallas World Aquarium and the Dallas-Fort Worth Marine Aquarium Society, actually when we hosted MAGNA in 2012, combined forces to contribute $5,000 to the Coral Restoration Foundation uh, in honor of MAGNA uh, in, in 2012 towards a mooring ball. So we're very proud of, of that and a lot of public aquariums are very, very engaged in that program. Um, another program you guys are very familiar with is the C-Corps program. And I, I won't go into a lot of detail here because I know you're familiar with it, uh, but there are a number of aquariums, especially the California Academy of Sciences, the Long Beach Aquarium, the Omaha, Henry Dorley Zoo, I could go on and on. Uh, that are involved with this program, support this program financially, and doing incredible things like the research they're doing right now on some of these auto desk uh, substrates. So um, just really innovative programs that are funded through their partnerships and, and basically through the admissions at their facilities. Uh, these are some folks from the Long Beach Aquarium who are working in the lab, and as you know, they go out during the spawning events, which I think Richard uh, just came back from a spawning event last week. Uh, they, they help these little larval corals settle uh, and they're trying to, all kinds of innovative ways to find, to make these little corals more successful uh, in recruiting uh, themselves back on the reef. So these are again some pictures of that uh, from, the, from the very good folks at the Long Beach Aquarium. Now this is a little bit different thing and I'm gonna kind of segue into the education aspect of things. Many of us serve as reviewers for a really great program at the Oregon Coast Community College. And Larry and Sid are here. Uh, Larry Bowles is the director of that program. Sid is also uh, very much involved in that program and what it has to do at the Hatfield Marine Science Center, which serves as a place for internships and practicums. But many of us, including Steve Vogel, is pictured in this room. Steve, where are you? I saw you a moment ago. Uh, from the Living Planet Aquarium, we go out, we have a fun trip to the Oregon coast uh, and review every aspect of that program and give them feedback about how they can help us train the next generation of aquarium scientists. And then we hire these people. In fact, we just hired two of Larry's students this year uh, and we're very pleased with them, Larry, so good job, by the way. Uh, and we've had one of their almost, I think, second, second 
uh, cohort of students that came through is one of our senior aquarists who's been with us for over 10 years. So um, great program. These kids hit the ground running. They know exactly what they need to do, how to do it. They understand the business, and that's an invaluable tool uh, for all of us. Um, but that's not enough. We need great qualified workers, but just training ourselves isn't going to get it done. So what are we doing in the greater world? So I'm going to start now with some individual uh, cases of incredible work that I wasn't even aware of that really blew my mind. And I know you all know Mitch Carl. You know the great and beautiful displays at the Omaha Henry Dorley Zoo. They have some of the best coral displays I've ever seen. Uh, big, huge coral heads. Uh, that it, it's, it's amazing. Um, I have been there. I have been to zoo school classes there. I, I thought I knew a lot about the Henry Dorley Zoo until Mitch put me in touch with one of their education managers, and she told me about their on-site school programs. And I don't mean just schools that come on field trips. I mean bona fide classroom uh, in conjunction with school districts. So they have a fee-based preschool. They have a zoo kindergarten that's based on a lottery system. So if kids want to go, they kind of join a lottery to become part of that formal kindergarten program. They have an eighth grade middle school program. They also have a high school program. And the high school program is actually, this year, has 120 students. They work in cooperation with six of their local school districts. And the kids spend their entire day, every day at the zoo. Their English, their math, their science, they have veterinary science, they have all kinds of programs, and those kids are doing science through the Omaha Henry Dooley Zoo uh, for free in conjunction with their school districts. And some of those students have already, before they've even left high school, published peer-reviewed journal articles. That's pretty impressive. They have already, in the time that this program has been started, since 2008 and 2009, they've already had six students complete the program and become veterinarians in the city of Omaha. So uh, pretty impressive and something I did not know was going on there. Um, now, I know that we're all familiar with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. If you know me, you know that I will frequently refer to this aquarium as the holodeck of aquariums. Um, I fell in love with it back in 1986, and I thought I knew a lot about the Monterey Bay Aquarium. We've been involved in their Seafood Watch Program. Just a show of hands, how many people are familiar with the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch Program? Oh, how exciting, that's wonderful. Uh, as you know, it's a great, easy way. You can get the app on your phone, and it's a great way to make wise, sustainable choices when you're buying your seafood. Great program. Uh, that's kind of a public education and outreach program. But the Monterey Bay Aquarium also has some really innovative programs for teens. And one of the things that struck me, they have teacher professional develop programs, they have incredible citizen science programs, they have outreach programs, their in-house uh, education programs are amazing. But something struck me when I was reading about the teen programs. And one of them uh, is focused just on, on sort of inspiring young women in science. The Watsonville Area Teens Conserving Habitats or the WATCH program, when the kids complete that, it's a one-year program that they come to the aquarium and they're involved in all kinds of aspects of that job. When they leave that program, not only do they get credit towards community service for graduation, but they get a scholarship. That's pretty cool. Uh, they, have a, they host a student uh, oceanography club, a teen conservation leader group, um, so these are the kind of things that, even though I've been there and, and know a lot about them, I've been there a number of times, I had no idea that you could become a basic volunteer or intern at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and then leave with a scholarship. And so that's really neat. And that Watsonville program, they do work with their local school districts as well. Um, another really neat uh, aquarium in the heart of the U.S., of course, is the Newport Aquarium. Newport, Kentucky, which is right on the border of Cincinnati. And they do some amazing things. They're part of the Hershen uh, family group of entertainment facilities. And when their director, Eric Rose, sent me information, he sent me information about this really neat program that's called the Living Curriculum Initiative. And what they've done is they've partnered with their local school district, and they are going into the classroom with living uh, sharks and rays. And they're following these students for the next three years to see what the impact is on 
their ability to learn the scientific method and retain that information as they go. So the first cohort of students went this year and they're gonna follow them for the next year and they've already been approved with some partnership funding to do that uh, for the next several years as well, which is great. So you can see here that they developed this program. Uh, it's the centerpiece is a question, claim, evidence, reasoning, inquiry model. And beginning in the third grade, as I said, they follow this, they have 12 contact hours and um, you can see the kids get to touch the animals, they get to see the animals. And then they're basically quantifying the data from this to see what impact it is having on these students. And one of the teachers said that taking them through this process was a great way to build upon the initial experience that the students were invested in the lessons. And their data is showing that 64% of the students identified that working with live animals helped them to better understand science, which is statistically significant from 41% prior to that program. So that's pretty special. Um, there's a lot of aquarium outreach programs in the country, and most of the aquariums evaluate those programs for their success, but this one really put a number to it in the first year. Um, this was actually featured in our AZA Connect magazine in July of this year, so pretty neat. Now, the Seattle Aquarium will be the host of AZA national meeting this year. I'm very excited about going there. One of the really neat programs that they are involved in is an actual um, volunteer program. They have a teen volunteer program. You can see what the kids go through. They have all kinds of training. Um, they pick conservation initiatives that they're going to be involved in. They're on the floor interacting with uh, the guests. And then uh, they actually run a social media campaign called Puget Sound, We Love You. And the kids actually run this program. And a lot of this is done also with their local school districts. So um, you don't even have to be uh, a student. You can volunteer and do that. What touched me about what was sent to me by their education and uh, volunteer coordinator was the quotes from the students. Um, I'll get emotional if I try to read these, but every guest interaction I have is an opportunity for change that I pride myself on because every visitor that walks through the doors of the aquarium can make a difference from the mouths of babes. Um, so this is, this is pretty neat. Now, Paul, I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip past that slide on accident, but there's nothing really to see here, but I, I would love to have had enough time to show this four minute video of the Joint Aquaculture Research Lab program. Paul Anderson is here behind you. He has two poster presentations that you can go and talk to him today. Paul and I have been friends for many, many years and he is a research biologist at the Mystic Aquarium, and he leads a really neat and innovative joint aquaculture program through the Mystic Aquarium where the kids are coming in, learning how to commercially uh, produce things like koi and other things, and also aquaponics. It's really neat, and the kids, on this YouTube video, the kids actually express wonderfully how much this program has meant to them. And uh, so they are inspiring the next generation of ocean, ocean uh, aquarium scientists and ocean conservation leaders, and that's pretty neat. But they don't stop there. They are working in partnership with a lot of other organizations to do things beyond that, to work towards sustainability in our collecting practices, especially in places like Indonesia and the Philippines. And I'm not gonna steal Paul's thunder by taking all this away. He spent a long time yesterday explaining it to me and there's no way in the world I can do that justice or frankly, any of these programs, I can do them the justice they deserve. Uh, but please stop by his poster. You can see that they're working on training on education for the fishers, for the wholesalers, for the stores. They work on, they're working on an, uh, testing for cyanide detection. Uh, just some amazing work being done and all of this through great collaboration. They're actually working on capacity building in areas where uh, animals are being collected and following models uh, from uh, organizations such as RARE uh, that are doing some great work in the field with the actual people whose livelihoods depend on this. And of course, that also comes with its own aquaculture and research development, uh, learning to, to raise uh, commercially important species and, and, um, and find out which ones uh, are probably the most viable. So great program, Paul. And, and like I said, I won't steal your thunder. Um, 
Now, I know you all are probably familiar with the New England Aquarium in Boston. It's an incredible facility, uh, one of the original Cambridge 7 designs. Uh, and not only is it a great and beautiful display, but they have some incredible programs. And uh, they have established in recent years the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life. And I, I try not to read, but I don't want to misspeak, so I'm going to read this for you. Um, there is a couple, the Anderson Cabot couple, that have been longtime members of the New England Aquarium and actually board members who are inspired by the work that the New England Aquarium does to donate a significant uh, financial investment to the New England Aquarium to establish this Center for Ocean Life. And the mission of that is saving species habitats and strengthening the overall health of our oceans. The combined, they combine marine conservation research with strategic partnerships and the formidable convening power of the New England Aquarium to combat the unprecedented impacts of our human activities in the ocean. And they are doing some incredible work through that. One of the neat things that Mark Smith, their director, shared with me was this GSO project. This was something I have only heard about every now and then, talked about at some of our, our industry meetings. Uh, but this is uh, Gulf Stream orphans that are wandering up the northeastern coast of the United States following the, the warming waters and showing up where they typically don't belong. And these are Caribbean reef species. So they have partnered with divers and with aquarists and with people in that area who all have an interest in this, universities and whatnot, in finding out what's there, what they can do about it, and, and what impact that has on that local ecosystem. So a really neat program. You may know uh, some of the folks from the New England Aquarium who have talked about some of their breeding programs. I think Javier probably knows. Uh, about some of these, but they've recently uh, cracked the nut on the blue chromis and some other things. So Mark sent me some pictures of that because they are actively engaged in uh, rearing species that, that are displayed at their aquarium and, and doing it in a, in a very uh, sort of uh, low-tech manner, which is really neat. Um, they have contributed over the years a significant amount of research, formal peer-reviewed research uh, and still continue to do that. And this is a, actually a graphic that they sent me just showing how many, and over the years since 1982, they have published more than 300 peer-reviewed papers. That is impressive. Um, they have a Marine Conservation Acting Fund, and you can see all the places around the world that they have worked and where they have an impact. They've done everything from sea turtle rehabilitation. I actually was just there in May last year and, and saw their incredible uh, facility off site where they do all kinds of stuff. So cold stun turtles and all kinds of things are there. Uh, but they also do some really neat things in terms of marine protected areas, um, especially their work with the Phoenix Island protected area, uh, which is out off near Fiji, and if you've ever heard Steve Bailey talk about this program, it is amazing. But that's something they started working on in 2000 and are still helping to support that today, actually establishing a, a protected area and helping to fund that so it remains protected uh, to this day. So it's not enough just to display some of these incredible things, but look what you're doing with that. Um, they also are very engaged in the climate change con uh, conversation, and they're actually helping to evaluate people's opinions on climate change and helping to train educators to speak about climate change in ways that people can understand uh, and make a difference. So that's part of a program that's actually part of the National Science Foundation and NOAA are big partners in that as well. And you can just see how many institutions and, uh, are participating in that as well. Okay. Uh, we, we're, we're working against Richard Ross right now. I think Charles Delbeek uh, is around as well and speaking this week. Uh, I don't know how much they'll be talking about the work they do at the California Academy of Sciences, but their director, Bart Shepard, sent me some great, amazing things. And I always tell Bart this, I live vicariously through him for what he does because I do not have the guts to dive at 400 feet. That's never going to happen. So I don't want to have to worry about my gear. I'm not going to sit there and read a laminated book at the decompression stops. Those things are never going to happen. So every video that he posts on social media and everything makes me drool because I would love to do that, but I'm never going to be brave enough to do that. Um, 
So they are not only going down and studying these environments uh, where people have never been or very few people have been or maybe a remote operated vehicle has been there, uh, but they started to develop tools to collect their animals and then they actually did an actual peer-reviewed study on the success or failure of that. And actually they were able to have an 89%, over an 89% survival rate with their little decompression chamber that I think they call a subcast and actually shipped those animals back to their facility to display to the public and they had a 96.6 survival rate, percentage survival rate for the animals that were decompressed during their dives and shipped on an airplane from the Philippines to uh, California. So very impressive work uh, that they're doing uh, as part of their Twilight Zone exhibit at the Steinhardt Aquarium. You may uh, be familiar with Luis and I will not pronounce his name right, but I'll call it Roja or Rocha. Uh, Luis is an incredible ichthyologist and underwater photographer, and they have actually discovered new species as part of their work and part of their research. And see, these are some of those incredible images of a lot of antheists and things that are found in that area. And I won't even try with my Texas accent to pronounce those scientific names. It's not going to happen. Um, you can ask Charles how to pronounce them. <laughs> Uh, but incredible images, and I'm very grateful to Bart for sharing this with us. Um, we're back to the Seattle Aquarium again. Uh, Tim Carpenter, who's a curator at the Seattle Aquarium, sent me some information about a great program that he's working on in Hawaii. I should also say that Tim is a huge uh, help in terms of the ag advocacy work that went on in Hawaii over the past few years uh, on behalf of the AZA and on behalf of his institution. Uh, but they have been working in Hawaii um, for many, many years and for 35 years have displayed Hawaiian species and helped educate the public about them at the Seattle Aquarium. But they take it a step further. In 2009, they expanded their conservation efforts and began annual reef surveys where they actually go out and if the videos hadn't been four or five minutes long, I'd be sharing them with you because they're very impressive and they're on dive comms and they're talking to one another and they go and, and measure different transects and they actually measure the abundance of different fish species in those areas. They're also doing water quality sampling in a lot of the reefs that they work on in Hawaii and they have data uh, going back for many years. So I only shared one slide, this was from, and Marge, how do you pronounce this? Puaco? What is it? Puco, see? I, oh, okay. Ask Marge how to pronounce it. I, I can't pronounce it. Marge is in Hawaii and we're glad to have her here. Uh, but they're actually measuring these things and studying them and then this, the, the slides that he sent me are quite numerous that I don't have the time to share with you. But basically, these are very popular aquarium species and they're, they're actually monitoring uh, their abundance over time in these areas um, as just part of their commitment to the species that they display at their aquarium. Great, great work. Um, this is a place I've never been, but a dear friend of mine, Barrett Christie, uh, is there now and he is their husbandry director and he shared some amazing things with me about the work they're doing at the Maritime Aquarium in Norwalk. One of the really neat things that they do there is they culture their own jellies. Well, they've actually been taking that a step further and they do other work in Colombia and this time uh, it has to do with climate change and crustaceans. And this time they actually trained some of the local Colombian aquarists how to raise their own jellyfish. So they sent me um, lots of pictures and images of that. So this is some of their collecting efforts. They collected their brood stock. They taught them how to raise them in the lab so that they can have their own ongoing jelly cultures at their aquarium there in Columbia, which is really neat. Um, they have their own research vessel. They go out and do a lot of water quality studies and environmental assessments in the areas uh, on the Long Island Sound and they have data stretching back for decades that show the water quality in the once heavily polluted sounds are rebounding. That's important, and that's just work that's being done by your local aquarium. Uh, they also, all of the sampling that they're doing there, they're actually have created and kept a database for many years with that information uh, about what species are found there and when. And they also have a really neat STEM program for young students uh, to work um, similar to some of the other ones we've talked about here. So another great 
great work. They also have a neat citizen science program, and I just had to share this because the pictures were so great. They go out at night and they tag horseshoe crabs. If you're not familiar with what's going on with horseshoe crabs is they're used in uh, blood research quite a bit, so their numbers have been dwindling. Uh, and uh, so this, they happen to be very prevalent uh, in their area, and so they take families and groups and their, their visitors out uh, into their local habitat and they go out at night and collect these animals. I just love the face of my kid. Just, he's so excited to be holding that giant horseshoe crab, so really neat, neat program. Um, back to the other coast, we go to the Long Beach Aquarium, and they have been working for many years on a program to help recover the white abalone. And uh, through that program, they actually go out and help not only uh, they collect brood stock and, and raise them in their uh, controlled environments, but then they go and outplant them back uh, into their local habitat. So they sent me some pictures. You can see in the buckets there, that's when they're about to spawn. Uh, the picture on the right that's kind of pink actually has little larva, abalone, uh, you know, uh, resting there. And then they take those, those as they grow up. They actually put them, and this is a picture of all the folks involved. Now, any of you guys in this room? Yes, all, all of you guys are in this room. Woo! And I just say guys, I mean ladies. All of you ladies in this room. Woo! Uh, their VP of Husbandry, Sandy Troutwine, and I are good friends and gone back many years. And uh, I was excited to see the, the work that's being done. Uh, but this is when you guys are out planning, am I right? Yes. Okay. Danny Munoz and uh, um, Alexandra sent me these. And uh, oops, I'm going to go back. Sorry about that. My thing is very touching. Um, but this is what really impressed me about this program beyond the fact that they've been doing this in collaboration with NOAA and their local fish and wildlife agents is that they have helped to contribute to the estimated 35,000 animals within the program, which is staggering in contrast to the estimated 1,600 left in the wild. So you think about the value of being able to raise these animals in a controlled environment in an aquarium. They put them in their own tanks and raise them until they're big enough to be outplanted. And uh, think of the impact. They're literally saving a species at their aquarium. Pretty impressive. Um, one of our newest members of the AZA is the Odyssey Aquarium, which is in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's a very unique uh, business model. Uh, when I reached out to them, they sent me some like, uh, volumes of pictures of uh, all the incredible things that they're doing in their local community. But you have to think about it. They're nowhere near really the ocean, six, eight hours from the ocean, kind of like us in landlocked Dallas. What do you do when you, don't ha you can't go out and necessarily tag animals and, you know, replant them because uh, you're not close enough to the ocean to be able to do that. You can still inspire the people that live there to care about the oceans. So every year they host an outreach event at their facility where they invite 40 conservation related organizations. This last year they had more than 6,000 people attend that event and they talk about everything from shark conservation to sustainable seafood to uh, pollution and, and being responsible citizens of our environment. And a neat thing that they sent me, which I want to share with you, is this video. They actually partner with another organization, and their staff goes out and does cleanups in their local lakes. Um, they do beach cleanups, they do all kinds of things, but they are making a commitment to their community in a different way, uh, even though they're, they're uh, they don't have the luxury of being on the ocean, but they're taking care of their local ecosystem there, which is incredibly important, and then sharing that information with their guests. So uh, I thought that was really neat. In just a second, the name of the group that they're working with will pop up. But um, this is something I'd love to see us do in Texas. This, this would be really cool. Of course, you can't see in the water at all, but <laughs> in any of our lakes, there's zero visibility. But yeah, so... Uh, kudos to, to our newest AZA Aquarium member. Uh, um, so close to home, I don't know how much time I have left. This is shocking to me. I have 10 minutes? God, that's a lifetime. Um, I thought by now <laughs> my sister-in-law is laughing because she helped me uh, 
be my sounding board till three o'clock this morning to make sure that any of this made sense to someone other than someone who works in this industry. Uh, if you're familiar at all with the Dallas World Aquarium, we are a very unique facility in the heart of downtown Dallas and our director is our owner. And he is very passionate about a number of things and when he's passionate about it, he will do whatever he can uh, to help. We have for many, many years donated far more than 3% of our operating budget towards conservation in places outside of our world. And then we work with really rare and unusual species uh, that are very popular with our guests. And we are working in collaboration with all of our uh, fellow aquarists uh, in helping to crack the nut in breeding some of these animals. My nearest and dearest to my heart is the leafy sea dragons and hopefully Javier and Tamara are gonna help us with this the next time we have some eggs. Uh, but I did have the great fortune um, back in 2006 and eight with some of our friends uh, or fellow aquarists at the aquarium to crack the nut on raising uh, ribbon sea dragons for the first time. These were animals that we got from our friends at Cannes Marine. So they were sustainably collected and uh, many of the vendors out there helped us in actually being able to feed these animals, including your Masna Award winner, Frank Bench, who was the first person to say, you need to be feeding the copepods to these uh, because the larvae are pelagic. And that really did it. And then the folks from Algogen helped supply us with copepods. So we're very grateful to those folks. Um, one of our favorite programs that's involved with our Antillian manatee at the Dallas World Aquarium is a rehabilitation and rescue program in Iquitos, Peru that stemmed from our collaboration with other manatee rehab folks um, in the US, especially the Florida um, manatee rehabilitators. And we became aware of the need for a facility to house and and rehabilitate young Amazonian manatees because their mothers were being caught and eaten. This is a very remote part of the Amazon rainforest and uh, one manatee can feed an entire village. Uh, and people were trying to raise these young manatees in their uh, backyard pools or ponds. And um, so there were a group of biologists there that made us aware that there was a need uh, for a facility. And so it started out very small in us trying to help just get them a very rudimentary pond or something to raise these and then supplying them with the, with the technology and the, and the veterinary care and the things they needed to help that. Well, that has stemmed into an incredible rescue and release program uh, where over the years we've uh, rescued, rehabilitated and released more than 15 little Amazonian manatees and tagged them. We employ six uh, biologists who are native to that area, who run the facility and go out into their local region and have literally seen more than 80,000 people and sometimes going out on a two hour canoe ride uh, to do a PowerPoint presentation in a, in a very rustic shack uh, to teach people about manatee conservation. So it's something we're quite proud of. The name of that center now is Acobia DWA Zoo. It is now a big uh, cooperative program with the government of that area and lots of sponsors, uh, but it stemmed just from somebody saying, hey, we need help in, in saving a young manatee. So uh, next year, I don't know exactly when yet, but uh, BBC has filmed our last release and they will be doing a story on that. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, we're, we're back to the sawfish swag discussion. If you guys weren't here at the beginning, one of the many hats that I wear through the shark specialist group is to be an advocate for sawfish research and conservation. And through our partnership with the species survival plan within the AZA for sawfish, and those of us who house sawfish at our facilities like we do at the Dallas World Aquarium, the SSP established an awareness day for sawfish. And we chose October 17th, which is coming up. It'll be our second annual uh, sawfish, International Sawfish Day. We gave presentations all over the place uh, leading up to this. We combined forces with conservation agencies and research facilities to get the word out via social media. You can see just a little bit here, one uh, Twitter blast uh, 
called a thunderclap from the deep in the UK, who is also hugely involved in this program. Just that one thunderclap reached 492,000 people on the actual day. At the Dallas World Aquarium, we worked with a local middle school called McCamey Middle School, which we're working with again this year. Um, and they came out and decorated our facility and actually made public service announcements. We distributed over 7,500 pieces of sawfish swag, including at MACNA last year, and did a poster. Kevin was gracious enough to allow us to, to do that last year and get the word out. You can see uh, the little girl in pink there is in Ghana. There's a research biologist that has taken the swag to Ghana and Madagascar, where she works to celebrate sawfish. And I just want to show you a quick video clip that was done by a 13-year-old at McCamey Middle School who made a PSA about saving sawfish. And if I can get it to run, uh, we'll see. No. There we go. Several of the students did PSAs. So this year, all of the students, and there's about 72 students, will be making public service announcements that will be available for you to share on your social media. Uh, so uh, again, from the mouths or the minds of babes. These are the kids that'll be the next generation that are gonna be saving the oceans. So how many minutes do I have? Four, gosh, that's great. Um, I don't know if you all know Chris Andrews. He's a former director of the, of the Steinhardt Aquarium. He's now in charge of the US uh, Aquariums for Sea Life and the Merlin Entertainment uh, Group, and they have a number of aquariums. Uh, Chris did a really great um, essay on public aquariums. It was his own personal opinion, and he actually uh, spoke about this at one of our uh, industry meetings. And some of the points that he made in his essay really touched home to me about what the future of our public aquariums is going to be, what's that going to look like. We have to create relevance to maximize conservation impacts, and that has to be done locally. So we're going to be doing something, we need to make sure that the people who come in our doors can connect with that. Animal wellness and welfare has to come first. Our animals have to be healthy, and they have to look good, and the displays have to look good uh, for that message to get out. We have to attract, intrigue, engage, and ultimately involve our guests in critical thinking and hands-on learning and inspire conservation action with the ultimate goal of demonstrating positive behavioral change. We want people to make a difference because they've come to our facilities. We have to have credibility, and that means consistency in our messaging through all communication channels, including social media. But our science has to be sound, and we have to be practicing what we preach. Um, we have to be sustainable in our own collection planning, and that's where some of the vendors who are out here are helping us do that. We have a huge um, organizational a uh, white paper that helps in collection planning for public aquariums, but I think we owe it to, as an industry to share what we know about trying to be more sustainable with your industry. And I think you'll hear more and more about that as time goes on. Uh, and because we do have some detractors that are trying to shut all of us down in terms of our ability to collect animals from the wild. Um, more research needs to be done on raising animals on aquaculture and money needs to be pumped in that direction so that can happen. Aquariums must become centers of excellence and I believe we already are, not only for science education in general but to promote the role of females and especially minorities in science conservation. I think that's a big growth area and those of you who were at the Women in Reefing uh, workshop yesterday, I think we would all agree uh, that we can be a more diverse uh, community. Um, Aquariums must continue to think global, but do more by acting with local relevance. And you've seen this, we're doing this. These programs blew me away by what people are doing in their local communities. So what if the army of those 51 million visitors and zoo goers, and if you include the zoo goers, then we're up to 180 million visitors a year within AZA facilities, were motivated to make a difference and transform conservation within a generation, that could happen. So with your support, we can turn these ripples into not just a wave, but a tidal wave for ocean conservation. Thank you. <laughs>